Well, in the longest recorded prayer in the Bible, Jesus speaking to his heavenly father, he prayed these words. He says to his heavenly father, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And I don't know about you, but when I reach the end of my life, I want to be able to pray that prayer. I glorified you on earth. I made much of you on earth. I let people know about you, not only through my words, but through my deeds, through my actions. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished, having finished the work that you have given me to do. And what's true is every single person in this room, every single person watching online, every single person on the planet has a God-ordained purpose for their life. They have God-ordained work to do. You, believe it or not, have God-ordained work to do in your life. Every single one of us has opportunities to fulfill the work that God has prepared for us to do every single day. And whether that's a conversation with somebody over a cup of coffee, whether that's walking with somebody who's going through a difficult time in life, whether that's meeting with a neighbor who's struggling or encouraging a coworker, or praying over a business decision and seeking God's guidance over a major life decision, whether that's being sacrificially generous toward a cause that's greater than ourselves, every single person has God-ordained work to do for us to walk in every single day. And maybe today you're here and you might not even realize that God even thinks about you, let alone has work for you to do. Right, and I, I want you to know that he absolutely thinks about you, he loves you, and he has a purpose and a plan for your life. And at the end of the service today, I just want to extend an opportunity for you not only to discover, if that's you, for you to discover not only who God is, but who he's made you to be and what he's created you to do in life. Because he has good plans for you and we want to help you discover what those plans are. And for those of us that maybe have been following Jesus for a while, if we're not careful and if we're not engaged in the good works that God has planned for us to do, we can fall into this mentality where we just sort of go, yeah, I, I believe in Jesus. I show up to church once a month or maybe twice a month or maybe if I'm really serious, three or four times a month. You know, it's interesting, on average, a, a churchgoer, there's all these statistics that pastors get all the time, and so one of the stats is like, on average, somebody attends a church service like 1.7 times a month, which I don't know how you attend .7. <laughs> Apparently, that's, that's, a, that's a stat. So maybe you attend more than that. Maybe you're an overachiever. Maybe you do two, three, four times a month. And, and you go, well, I, I show up occasionally, I give a couple bucks here and there, I'm a little bit involved. I might even serve a little bit. I believe in Jesus. And, you know, that's sort of what my Christianity is, is all about. You know, I, I'm basically set on meeting a minimum standard requirement in order to make God happy so I can make sure that I go home to heaven one day so that I can prove that I am worthy of heaven one day. And I need every single person in the room watching online to hear me on this today, if that's you, God has so much more for you than that. He has so much more for you than just a bland, mundane, kind of what, just ethereal, abstract belief in God to somehow make God happy to get home to heaven. God has a purpose for you here and now. He's got work for you to do here and now. You know, this picture, uh, some of you have asked me about this, you know, like, what's that all about? What is that picture? And maybe you've been wondering that. And, and here, here's the reality, the, the, the picture has a double meaning. So it's a welder, and he's working on some metal. And, you know, in, in metalworking, in welding, metal is placed under intense pressure and heat in order to transform it. And it is changed... And in the process of its own transformation, it is given a purpose by the welder, a purpose that is greater than itself. And as we talk through the book of James, the reality is God invites us into a life of 
transformation and change, not for our own sake, but for the sake of a cause greater than ourselves. And if you're here and you've settled for a life absent of purpose and meaning, God has something for you today. If you've settled for a life void of significance, uh, of something that, that you can sacrifice for, uh, a life void of transformation and trials and change, God's invitation to every single one of us today is to discover maybe for the first time or discover again what it means to live life with a genuine faith. A faith that not only works in us and changes us, but a faith that works through us and brings change and transformation to the world around us. If you brought your Bibles, go ahead and turn to James chapter two. And if you don't have a Bible with you today, uh, that's okay, we'll have the words on the screen uh, for you. James chapter two, starting at verse 14. We're gonna read through verse 26. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says this. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person? Don't you just love James? You wanna be shown, you foolish person? There's other words we could place in there. Okay, don't you wanna be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Not useless, useless. <clears throat> Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. There is a whole lot in here, but there's three areas that James talks about where we're gonna go today. We're gonna talk about a dead faith, a detached faith, and a devoted faith, and the differences between the three. So let's talk about a dead faith. So James, in James 2, verse 14, he says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? Now, throughout the history of the church, over the last 2,000 years, there have been many different approaches and many different views on how the church should engage with the outside world how Christians and how the church should engage with the world around us. And there's kind of four major categories that I wanna break down for us so we can tell the difference. The first category, the first approach, is basically a church or the Christian that separates from the world. The, the church or the Christian whose primary goal is to isolate from the evil world out there. And they won't really engage in relationship with anybody that doesn't already believe what they believe that doesn't think the way they think, that doesn't view the world the way that they do. And, and their primary concern is that the world will rub off on them and so they isolate from it, right? And, and the problem with this is that because their primary concern is with personal purity or personal morality, they essentially isolate from the world and they never really engage in the mission of God or the work of God for their life. Right, so that's the first category, is the church or the Christian that's separate from the world. The second one is the church against the world, or the person, the Christian, that's against the world. And this is the, the, the church or the Christian who's always seeking to wage war with the outside world. Its primary view, primary approach to outsiders is condemnation and judgment. Jimmy talked a little bit about this last week. 
And, and its primary concern is condemnation and judgment and to remain at a, at a safe enough distance to maintain whatever preconceived ideas or stereotypes, stereotypes they have of, of that particular group of people. So if you think about it, it's the culture wars. It's a church that publicly rails on people. People that don't believe in Jesus for not living up to a standard that they don't even hold for themselves and never claim to hold for themselves. Uh, John Newton, the author of the great hymn, Amazing Grace, I, I love the way he writes this. He says, whatever it be that makes us trust in ourselves that we are comparatively wise or good, so as to treat those with contempt who do not subscribe to our doctrines or follow our party is a proof and fruit of a self-righteous spirit. In other words, within this, this person or group of people, community of people, that are constantly set on waging war and railing against an unbelieving world, there is a spirit of self-righteousness, of contempt, of pride of condemnation. Now what's just as dangerous is the third category. So we've got a church separate from the world, a church against the world, the third category is the church of the world. This is the church that doesn't have any real distinction from the world around us. They're so fixated on earning favor with people that are critiquing the church or critiquing Christians or critiquing Orthodox Christianity they're so fixated on earning favor with those people that they begin to compromise the truth of God. And oftentimes this is done in the name of grace and love. But the way God defines love is very different than the way the world defines love. Right? The world says, if you don't celebrate my sin and celebrate my lifestyle and my life choices, then you don't love me. Or if you disagree with me in any way, then you don't love me. And that is absolutely not the way that God defines love. Love. We can love one another and completely disagree. Right? So this happens under the guise of grace and love. And the problem with the, the, the compromises that are made over time is that anything that might have been compelling or different about that person's life or that church's life that might draw somebody to God is then done away with. So if you think about progressive churches, they basically say, well, the Bible isn't necessarily the word of God. It's really just a collection of writings from our ancestors that we can learn from. Or Jesus is just one of many ways to go to God. He was a good teacher, but he's one of many ways. And so the progressive church begins to cherry pick the scriptures in order to make it appealing to an unbelieving world that's critiquing the church and it's incredibly dangerous because that church or that person becomes indistinguishable from the world that God has called us to reach. And the last one, the fourth category, is the kind of church we want to be. We want to be a church for the world. We want to be a church that seeks to serve and bless those that are far from God without compromising the truth of God. It's the church that seeks the welfare of all people not just our people. That's why James writes this in James 2, 15. He says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food. So this is the person in need in your life. It's a neighbor that's going through a hard time or a friend whose marriage is in shambles or a coworker that was just let go or lost their job and they're struggling to make ends meet. So when you see people, when you, when you interact with people in need, and James continues, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled. Our version of that is, God bless you. When God closes one door, he'll open another one eventually. You just got to be patient and trust him. You know, God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called to, according to his purpose. And, and that's true, it's just not the right time, right? Timing matters. It, it's, it, it's essentially going, yeah, you just need to trust God a little bit more and maybe you won't be having such a hard time. Or, or it's, it, it's basically saying, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pray for you and we never do. Or what we say in the South, bless your heart. Right, it, it, 
It's essentially, it, it, this is the problem with the dead faith. This is the, and listen, we're all, I, I've done that. I've, I've learned that if I don't pray for the person right in the moment, sometimes I'll just, I'll forget. And I mean to. My intentions are good, but if I go, man, I, I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna pray about that. If I don't write it down, a reminder. In my, so I'm learning that if I don't just do it in the moment. <laughs> and, and what's true <clears throat> is the problem with the dead faith is it says a whole lot, but it doesn't do squat. It says an enormous amount, but when it comes to actually doing something, where the rubber meets the road, there's no action, that there's no movement, there, there's no works, right? And I, you know, it's basically, you're going, I, I'm sure God will provide the meals that you need. I know you're going through a rough time. God will provide in his perfect timing. It, can I just offer something to you, if, if that's you? <clears throat> and you've become aware of the need, God is providing meals for that person. It's in your pantry, go home and cook it and bring it to them. <laughs> right? If you're aware of the need, God is providing you to meet that need. Uh, about a year and a half ago, <clears throat> my, my wife Misty had uh, back surgery. She had a pinched nerve and had a discectomy. She was gonna be laid up for a number of days. And as we were preparing for that week, we've got four kids, and sort of preparing for that week, I had a number of people come and ask me, like, hey, you know, is there anything you need? What, what, what can we do? And I'm going, I, 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 I don't know exactly. I'm not sure what to expect. I'm sure I need something. I just don't know what it is. And the surgery came, and Missy was recovering. And basically, my plan for our children was, for meals at night, was gonna be cereal, pizza, and ice cream for the week. <laughs> which they were thrilled about. <clears throat> and thankfully, a group of people here in the church got together, and even though I couldn't necessarily articulate what the need was, they just started showing up at the house and dropping meals off for our family. And I've learned a couple of things, and I'm still learning, but one of the things I learned during that time was that sometimes it's easier for us to help others than it is to ask for help. And sometimes it's easier to, to help other people who are in need than it is to even, it's humbling, right, to ask for help. That's one thing. The other thing is when we're really going through a difficult time, sometimes we don't even know how to articulate what our needs are. And so in that moment, what it requires of us, what it would require of me when a need comes up is for me to go, God, if I'm in their shoes, what would bless me? If I'm in that situation, what would be beneficial? Right? Maybe it's providing a meal. Maybe it's just sitting down with somebody over a cup of coffee and listening to them and hearing somebody out and asking good questions. Or maybe if somebody is struggling financially, maybe it's, it's getting them a gift card to Kroger or showing up with a bunch of groceries or something. But here's, here's the invitation that I think God is giving us. We can't always wait for the other person to articulate exactly what it is that they need because they might not even know. So sometimes we have to be assertive and just go, you know what, God, direct me. I want to be a blessing. Would you show me what to do for this person? And just do it. All right, so James says, if one of you says to a person in need, go in peace and be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it, does, if it doesn't have works, it's dead. You know what a dead faith does? Nothing. Nothing. A dead faith doesn't produce anything. It's not living. It's not active. It's a professing faith, but it's not a practicing faith. And what James tells us here is that if you have a professing faith without a practicing faith, your faith is worthless. It's useless. It's powerless. It's pointless. Right? That's a dead faith, and he's warning us that as people who maybe have been attending church for a long time, or be, you know, we are, are, would say, yeah, I'm a Christian, I've known Jesus, that, that we wouldn't settle for a dead faith that is inactive because it is useless and powerless and dangerous. Now, the other type of faith that James describes here, it's fascinating, is what we'll call a detached faith. 
James 2.19, it says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. You know the demons believe in Jesus? Demons believe in Jesus. You know what that means? It means we can have good theology, we can have the right doctrine, we can believe the right things, we can think the right things, we can talk about the right things, we can talk the Christian talk, we can look like Christians on the outside, just like the demons do, and guess what? It doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't mean anything. It's a useless faith if it just ends there. We can say, well, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus, and I'm, you know, I, comparatively speaking, I'm a pretty good person. I'm pretty moral. I, I attend services. I give here and there. What else does God expect me to do? And if that's us, our faith is no different than the demons. Why? Because it acknowledges truths about God without any affection for God. It acknowledges truths about God without any love for God. So James says, you believe that God is one, you do well. In other words, congratulations. Good for you. You want a trophy? He says, you believe that God is one, even the demons believe and shudder. Now, to shudder, it means to tremble out of repulsion or disgust or disdain. Right? So God, what James is saying, God is repulsive to the demons. They know who he is. They, they believe, but they don't love. They believe in him. They know who he is. They know his power. They just don't know him. Right? It's knowledge without knowing. It's recognition without relationship. There's a recognition of who Jesus is without any depth of relationship with Jesus. See, a detached faith it pays lip service to God without love for God. It can talk about God. It can look good on the outside. But internally, there is no genuine love or affection for God. There's no awe or wonder about who God is or what he's done. And what's amazing is this kind of faith, honestly, on the outside, it can look very similar to a genuine faith. That's the dangerous thing. It is, you know, 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, man judges man by the outward appearance. What we see is on the outside, but only God knows the heart. See, a, a person with a detached faith and a person with a, a devoted faith can look almost identical on the outside. We could spend the whole day together. We could spend weeks together. And honestly, at the end of the day, we would kind of have a hard time distinguishing who really loves God and who's serving him out of, out of fear or obligation, not out of love or affection. See, th there's, a, there's a line of trees in, in our backyard. And uh, some of the trees, there, there are some large trees, some of the trees are, are living. And a couple of the trees are, are dead trees. And there are certain times of the year where you look at the trees, you, you cannot tell the difference between which ones are living and which ones are dead. Right? And the same is true with our faith. So how do we make sure our faith is living and active? And what does it mean to have a devoted faith? So let's talk about a devoted faith. James 2.18. He says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Now, some Christians or theologians or scholars, they'll take this passage and say, well, okay, James here, the author, is contradicting what the Apostle Paul writes in other parts of the scripture. Because James here is saying that we're justified by works, not by faith alone. But Paul, in Ephesians, he's, he says that we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. So it sure seems like, on the surface, it sure seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? Now, I do have to say that James is being a little bit provocative here, right? He, he's, he's poking the bear a little bit. Like, he, he wants to get a reaction out of this. He's trying to kind of wake us up and kind of bring us to our senses. But what James is not doing is saying this. He's not saying that in order to be saved, you and I, we have to earn it. He's not saying that. He's not saying you have to work harder, run faster, do more for God. 
and hope that one day that your good works, that you'll have done enough to prove to God that you are worthy of heaven. That is absolutely not what James is saying. How do we know that? Because he would have known the Old Testament scripture out of Isaiah 64, all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. They're like filthy rags. Our good works amount to nothing apart from the grace of God over our lives. No matter what we do, we cannot earn salvation. Romans 3.23 tells us for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. Every single one of us. We have fallen short of perfection, of holiness. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Right? There's not one single exception. So what is James saying? Well, James 2, 20 through 21, he says this. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? He's going, you want me to prove it to you? Okay. And then he, verse 21, references the Old Testament. He says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Abraham did not withhold his own son from God. Isaac represented all of his hopes, all of his dreams for his future, and he didn't even withhold that from God. Not because of a law, not because it was a rule, but he offered his own son up to God because of his love for God. He withheld nothing from God. Verse 25, and in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So Abraham, Rahab, both Old Testament characters, James is referencing not what they believed, he's referencing their deeds. He's referencing what they did and he's pointing to them and he's saying, see, it's because of what they did, because of their actions, because their faith was active and living, it justified, or another way to say it, is it proved or revealed a relationship and a righteousness with God that was already present in their life. So what James is saying is this, works don't earn salvation, they validate it. Works, good works, they, they don't earn salvation, they prove the genuineness of your salvation, right? They legitimize the genuineness of our faith. I love the way that John Bloom writes this. He says this, our faith is revealed by our works, our creeds are revealed by our deeds, and our love for him is revealed by our love for others. God makes it very hard for us to fake it. He, can I just offer something? If you don't love people, you know what that means? It means you don't really love God. If you're so set on condemning and judging people that are far from God, what that reveals is a self-righteousness in you that's keeping you from actually loving the people that God has called you to love. Yes. See, we got work to do, church. If we're so busy getting caught up in the culture wars and things that God is looking at going, man, I wish you would just get over yourself and love the people I've called you to love. Yeah. See, God has a mission for the church to fulfill. I, I, I found something this last week I, I just thought was fascinating. It's, it's a great quote. It essentially says, God does not necessarily have a mission for his church. He has a church for his mission. So what is his mission? to love him and love people. Love one another and love those outside of these walls. God has a plan and purpose for your life and it's so much bigger than you could possibly imagine. Now some of us, we hear these things and we go, oh no, I, I need to get to work, right? I, I'm a Christian, at least I think I am, and so I, I better start serving, I better get involved, I better start, start doing stuff, I'm just gonna really love people outside of the walls of the church, I, I better start giving like crazy, I, I better start serving like crazy, I better get active, or else maybe that proves that I'm not really a Christian and maybe God doesn't really accept me or that my faith isn't genuine. And listen, as the pastor of this church, just 
confession right here, I would love for you to do all those things. <laughs> but stop and think with me for a second. If you let that thought pattern drive you to serve, to give, to action, to do for God, just ask, what? What is driving those things? What's the motive underneath the surface that's driving your doing, your serving, your giving? What's the motive? What is it? What do you think? If you're going, that's how I know I didn't do a good job explaining, okay. <laughs> if you're going, I better start serving, I better start giving, I better start doing or else, maybe that means I'm not a Christian. Maybe that means I'm not okay with God. What's the motive? Somebody said it. Fear. 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 And if fear is your motive for doing for God, if fear is your motive for serving God, if fear is your motive for giving, can I just tell you right now, you are no different than the demons in our passage. They believe in Jesus, and they shudder. They're afraid. Now, there's a difference between having reverence and respect for God, the fear of God, reverence and respect, being in awe of God, and being afraid of God. It's a big difference. And if you're serving and doing, and your faith is active, active, because of fear, because of being afraid, you're no different than the demons. Right? You're shuddering just like the demons do in our passage. Works driven by fear is evidence of a dead or detached faith. It's empty religion. But do you know what the opposite of fear is? It's not courage. Courage is action, taking action in the face of fear. The opposite of fear is love. 1 John 4, 18 tells us there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. See, if we serve God because we're afraid of God, it proves that we don't really know God. We don't, we don't really know him. If we serve God because we're afraid, it proves that we, we've never really seen the love of God, the goodness of God in the person of Jesus. But when you see all that Jesus has done for you, all that he endured for you, that he set aside all of his rights and privileges, that he came down, lived as a human being, suffered for you and me on our behalf, went to the cross, was crucified in the most brutal way possible, was buried, conquered death, hell, and the grave, rose and ascended to heaven because he loves you. When you see that, all of a sudden, it drives out your fear and you begin to serve God. You begin to get generous toward God, not out of fear, but out of love and gratitude because of his grace over your life. All of a sudden, you're set free to be a person that loves other people because you've received the love of God and you love him in return and you can't help but give your life to him. See, that is what the gospel does for us. And when you see, like Abraham is referenced in this passage. Abraham, you didn't even spare your own son from God, yet God spared your son. And when you see God, you didn't even spare your own son, whom you love for me. You gave up your son for me. How in the world, after seeing that, could I ever doubt your love for me ever again? How could I ever live in fear of a father that loves me that much? How could I not freely give my whole life to him after he laid everything down for me. See, when you see that, you know what it, it does? It, is it invites you to trust God in a way that you never could before. It invites you into a friendship with God. It, it allows you to see the beauty and the loveliness of God. 
the kindness of God, the gentleness of God. And only when we see that can we move from a dead faith or a detached faith to a genuinely devoted faith. A faith that is proven. A faith that is evidenced by our works. See, good works are a byproduct of a genuine faith. And only when you, when you see what God has done for you can you genuinely love people in need. Not out of fear, but out of gratitude and grace. When you see people in need, people that are far from God, only then, when you see that God loved you that much, can you love and serve them with no strings attached. Not expecting anything in return, not even a thank you. <laughs> because Jesus Christ came not to be served, he came to serve. While we were his enemies, he died for us. Right, and so here's my question for you today. What is God saying to you? Through this passage, through what we've talked about, what is God saying to you today? And think about your own life, the people you're in relationship with. Is there someone in need that you know about? Someone who's struggling right now? Someone who's going through a really hard time? Or maybe is there someone that you're connected to that has walked away from God or that's far from God or has given up on him? Here's the good work I think God has for us this week. Not only to pray for them, yes, pray for them, but to reach out and connect with them. To build a bridge toward them, to love them, to serve them, to go out of our way to be kind to them and generous toward them and not expect a single thing in return. Love them with no strings attached. Love them without needing anything in return and see what God might do. Can, can I just tell you, this is how I came into the kingdom. This is how Jesus saved my life. A couple of people decided that they were going to be radically, sacrificially generous and loving toward me for months. They never once began to knock on the door and ask me to open the door to share Jesus. Like, you don't need to show up to a meeting with somebody that's far from God that you've met with maybe once or twice or you barely know and like, feel like you need to preach the gospel to them that day. Lead them in the sinner's prayer that day. Can I just tell you, it took months of time of people loving me day in, day out, showing grace and kindness to me day in, day out. And eventually, they never had to knock on that door. I was gladly willing to open that door and invite them to walk through it. When I was ready to hear about Jesus, I opened the door. They didn't have to kick it down. They didn't have to force their way in. If they did, I would have written them off. See, what would happen if we just began to love people, to love people the way Jesus has loved us? Jesus loved us with no strings attached just to give us the opportunity to say yes to him. What would happen if you loved people, if you were kind to people, generous to people, if you served people that were far from God? I think eventually they would go, you know what? There's something different about you. What is it that you have? Because I, I don't get it. And I'm curious. Would you tell me a little bit about your church or what you believe? I think if we loved people and served people the way Jesus loved and served us, I think that would happen all the time. I wanna invite the prayer team to come forward and you might be here today and you go, man, Rob, I, I don't even know God. I, I'm fumbling my way through life. I've got no vision. I've got, I've got no direction. I've got no real meaning or greater purpose for my life. I, I'm just kind of fumbling my way through it. I, I just need to tell you, if that's you today, God brought you here today. God knew that you would be here listening to this message today. And he brought you here so that you might say yes to him. So that you might give your life to him. So that you might say yes to discovering not only who God is, but who he's made you to be and what he's called you to do. Because he has good plans for your life. 
and we wanna help you discover him and discover what those plans are. And maybe you're going, man, I, I, I don't know if my faith is genuine and you need to come to God and you, you need to give your life to Christ or come back to Christ, maybe you've wandered away. We wanna give you the opportunity to do that. And come let one of our prayer team members know in just a moment. Because during this next song, we're, we're gonna pray for one another and if you need to give your life to Jesus today, if, you, if you're ready to say yes to God, yes to God's plans for your life, yes to God's vision for your life, come let one of our prayer team members know. We would love to help you get started in your life with God. Or any prayer need, for that matter. If you've got something you're walking through, you're going through a difficult time, you, you've got a need that you need to bring to the Lord, or you know somebody that you wanna pray for, can I, I just, church, can I, I just need to tell you this right now. This, right here, is where the rubber meets the road. It's not singing the songs, it, although it's important, worshiping in God in song, we're commanded. It's not listening to a message. Can I just tell you, if we don't let those things drive us into relationship and conversation with God, it really isn't accomplishing much. And so the invitation for all of us today is simply this. If we have a need that we never bring to God, if we have a request that we never bring to God, we'll never know what God might have done if we would just ask. And so whatever need you have, wherever you are, I wanna invite you to respond in prayer to him today and see what God might do in and around and through your life. Church, would you stand and pray with me and we're gonna respond together. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. The invitation into the good works that you've prepared for us to do. Not out of fear or obligation or religious duty but out of love and gratitude for all that you are and all that you've done for us. Jesus, we thank you that you laid everything down for us. And God, again today, we lay everything down, everything about ourselves, our lives, our work, our relationships, we lay it all at your feet. And God, we ask you to guide our steps. And as we respond to you today, would you move in power? Would you work miracles? God, would you bring salvation to those who need it today? God, would you help us discover not, not what we want for our lives, what you want for our lives, because we know that your plans are infinitely greater than anything we could come up with on our own. God, we wanna follow you and live according to your ways today. And so we respond to you now, believing that you are good and you are powerful and you wanna move on our behalf. So we respond in faith and in worship and in prayer now. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen. Let's respond to him now.